I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. There is a scandal that is so big that even Elon Musk has tweeted about it, and it's been trending on Twitter, Google, YouTube, and it's a scandal in the chess world, not the most likely world for scandals, but essentially, the world champion of chess, Magnus Carlsen, who I greatly, greatly admire. He's the, probably the best chess player in history. I mean, he's just amazing. And he lost a game to a very young player, a 19-year-old named Hans Niemann, who I also admire and whose games are very wonderful to watch. And there was an immediately afterwards, Magnus quit the tournament. He has never done that before. And every there was wild speculation. Why did he quit the tournament? Even Gary Kasparov, who's been on this podcast, who was a former world champion, said this was unprecedented and we need more. We need to hear something from somebody about what is going on. But the implication was, is that Carlson may have thought, we don't know what he thought, but he may have thought Hans Niemann cheated. First off, how do you cheat in live chess over the board? We'll discuss this in a second. But Hans Niemann did admit that when he was 12 years old and when he was 16 years old, he did some cheating online. So that is what is known. I bring on the world's greatest expert in chess cheating, and he uses computer analysis to determine if people are cheating. He has analyzed hundreds of thousands of games, tens of thousands of cases of alleged cheating, all the way going back to a world championship in 2006, where one player accused another of cheating by using a computer in the bathroom. And Ken Regan is not only a computer science professor at the University of Buffalo, who's done a lot of excellent work on chess cheating and, and other things, but he's also an international chess master. He's a very, very strong player. He doesn't remember it, but in 1988, I played him a casual game uh, 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 that when we just randomly met each other, and I lost that game. And I remember specifically him explaining how I lost the game and how I might have been able to won, to, to win. But now I'm so grateful to talk to him uh, however many years later, 35 years later, and talk to him about this, this scandal, given that he is the expert. And I think what he says is kind of the conclusive answer about what is happening in the chess world right now. And without further ado, here is Ken Regan. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. 
Professor Ken Regan and also international chess master Ken Regan. You are the world's expert on identifying computer chess cheating. You're, you work with all the major online chess servers. You help tournament organizers for over the board tournaments as well. That's when people are playing live and in front of each other. You have been very successful identify, both identifying cheaters and identifying people who are not cheating. And I have many questions about cheating in general, but I also have questions about the recent scandal, Magnus Carlsen, maybe he didn't accuse anyone of anything. That's the genius of Magnus Carlsen, but he insinuated that a player he had played might've been cheating over the board, or at least there's some suspicion. And again, we don't know what Magnus Carlsen was, was accusing anyone of, and it's, and there's no evidence of anything, but maybe give a little bit of a lay of the land. And just in general, how do people cheat at chess? Okay, well, I've put all the different mechanisms by which people have cheated chess to a Dr. Seuss rhyme uh, in my 2014 TEDx Buffalo talk. And I even left out one verse, which was some had computers in their shoes or had them hidden in the loose. The reality of it is, have you heard the one about how your iPhone is more powerful than the world's best supercomputer in 1993? Well, uh, 1993 is only a little before when Deep Blue beat Kari Kasparov. And the fact definitely is that your phone can play chess better than I measured Deep Blue play. So I measured Deep Blue pretty well playing at 2850 level against Kasparov. But with a cell phone, you can be over 3,000 uh, far out of touch of what any human on the planet, including Magnus Carlsen, is capable of sustaining for a long period of time. And Ken, just to define some terms, chess has a rating system where let's say the average player is rated 1500 and every 100 to 150 points higher or lower is another standard deviation. Meaning if you're 1650, you could be to 1500 probably two out of three times. To put it clearly how good Magnus Carlsen is, he's 2,800, which means he'll never lose to pretty much anyone <laughs> except yes. like one of the top 20 players in the world or top 100 players in the world. Yes. And he's at 2,800 because Stockfish, which is the computer on Lee Chess and Chess.com is probably around 3,500 from what I understand. Yes. Here's my view of the world, which Alpha Zero upended to some extent. So the, the, the designed standard deviation of the rating system is 200 kilos. That's at the source. At, at the end, it depends on how many games you play. So the, uh, the linchpin of the rating system is that if you are 200 rating points stronger than your opponent, then you expect to take about 75% of the games. Now, actually, because of rating uncertainty, it's a little less. Uh, I could go into that, but that's the main idea. So now this, this 200 rating points, 75% expectation is the notion of a class unit in the U.S. rating system. That's why class A, class B, class C are all 200 rating points wide. And the Hungarian writer Laszlo Mero abstracted this to other games. So the depth of the game is the number of class units from a beginning adult player to the world human world champion. By the way, this is a fascinating way to look at whether a game is quote unquote interesting or not. So, so like chess realistically probably has 15 or so, maybe more, maybe like 20 classes because at the higher levels, it's more, a little more fine grained. At the time, Mero and people like me, uh, tabbed the beginning of the scale at 600, but we have scholastics where there are valid ratings below 100 and the 200 point difference is known to be still operating down there. So 100 is the USCF floor, but there are proposals to remove it. They don't want people to have negative ratings now. And so, so some games that have, by the way, some games that have rating systems very similar to this rating system is ping pong has a rating system yep. that works exactly the same. I believe backgammon. Well, it's, it's wider than that. 538.com uses ELO ratings unadorned with exactly the same principle. So I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. So chess. From, from 600 to 2,800 is 11 class units. Laszlo Mero uh, measured uh, backgammon and checker as at 10 class units. Japanese chess at 14 class units. Wow. And go, the figure I saw was 25 to 40. Obviously, you should use the lower end of that scale, but uh, even so, Alpha Zero, Alpha Go busted it. 
But anyway, the point is that this is a measure of the progress of Moore's law on the software end. So it took about eight or nine years longer to beat Japanese chess than chess, our chess, because of the three class unit difference. Okay, so you can phrase the software Moore's law in terms of the number of class units per year that computers improve. And that's the conceit of a paper that I wrote by invitation for the Springer Verlag 10,000 Lecture Notes of Computer Science Anniversary issue called Rating Computer Science via Chess. So at any rate, cut it simple, our phones definitely outclass us by several class units. And I put 3,500, 3,600 as a good estimate of where the best computer programs uh, running at standard time controls are now. So just to be clear then, like if someone is at a tournament, mm -hmm. regardless of their rating, but let's just say they're playing in a regular tournament near their town, they're 1800 rated, 1500 rated, they have a phone in their pocket, they go to the bathroom, they shut the bathroom door, put in the moves of their game, and the computer tells them a move, that move is going to be the best move in that position. Almost certainly or certainly good enough. And to be clear again, there's, let's say, two types of cheating. I'll call one stupid cheating and the one more sophisticated. Stupid right. cheating is if you take every single move and run it through the computer. More sophisticated would be three or four times in the game, you go to the bathroom when you're a little unsure what's happening and you get the best move in that. And 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 former world champion Viswanathan Anand has been known to say, even if you do that once, it can make it could result in a difference of 150 rating points over time. And I think that is accurate. One bit is 150 yellow. I think it's that. And so in tournaments, typically, like a big, wide open tournament, they'll say no phones in the bathroom. They have trouble enforcing it, but they enforce it as best they could. And in a more sophisticated tournament, they'll even do detectors and search you and, and so on for your phone. But on, let's talk online cheating first, which is on chess.com. I could simply have my phone on next to playing, you know, on my computer on chess.com. Anybody could do this. And and cheating apparently is, is very widespread. I don't want to say it's the norm, but it happens more than one would think. Like I regularly get emails from chess.com saying, we noticed someone you played was cheating. You got your rating points back. So yeah. I get that maybe like once every couple of days. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Bayesian prior rate of cheating in online chess is 100 to 200 times higher than over the board. I can't even imagine, by the way, how to do it over the board other than the bathroom I, thing I just described, which we've seen. There was a there was a case a few years ago, a grandmaster who was uh, suddenly went from like twenty five hundred to high twenty six hundreds, uh, like in a matter of months. He, there's a photo of him in the bathroom looking at his phone that he was hiding in his pants. Yeah, I don't know which one. There are several of those. So, so, yeah. so. Well, so yeah, I, I, maybe you're talking about Grandmaster Igor's rouses. Yes, that was in 2019. Yeah. There have been earlier cases. So, so before we get to the current scandal, online cheating, how do you really detect it? Like, how, how does one detect it? How does chess.com detect it? And I know they use you as a consultant or whatever, but. Yeah, chess.com has a multifaceted cheating system, and I generally always defend it. Uh, you could say that it has two or three prongs, of which only one prong overlaps what I do. Uh, so the, the statistical prong involves the engine similarity of the played moves, possibly taking into account the time control. Uh, but then there's also information that they gather through their interface. Okay, that is that is more of a trade secret, so I cannot go into that. Right, but what, what if I were to guess, and, and from little pieces here and there, is they see if you're swapping screens uh, and, you know, if, depending on the browser and the browser's API, my guess is they probably should have deals with other companies that have chess computers involved so they can see if you're switching to a screen with a chess computer running and, and so on. My, my guess is they're, they're looking a little bit more at screen swapping during, or tab swapping during a game. Yeah, and there are two other things. So there are two common places that are publicly known that I can say without compromising anything. One is if you use a bot to execute your moves, that bot is going to click on the same pixel every time relative to the square. So mm -hmm. might click in the dead center of the square. Okay, that's certainly not something that a human being using a mouse is able to do. So that pattern will get you detected in three or four moves. And then the other one is if you get in the habit of consulting something 
off your main screen, you might show that habit even when you have an obvious recapture. So a telltale little head delay of obvious recapture. Okay, so those are funny things, but it gets to the idea of, of, of and around those are very sophisticated Gaussian model, modeling the distribution of times actually taken by a human player to play an obvious recapture. This is what it's, it's the uh, data that it's compared against. It's mathematically very similar to how the Higgs boson was detected by contrasting the bumps from the experiments involving likely decays of the Higgs boson to just ordinary background decays. So I see. So if there's an obvious recapture, you either do it instantly or for whatever reason you're away from the board, there's an arbitrary amount of time it takes. It's not like every three seconds, like clockwork, there's a move. Yes, exactly. Because sometimes I'm not looking at this game that I'm playing. I'm maybe reading a Facebook post because there's an obvious forcing sequence happening and I don't always make the recapture instantly, for instance. Yeah. But then it's more random the time I take. Right. So the main thing about this is that online providers have access to much larger amounts of information than I do. I use only the moves in the game. And curiously, I don't even use the timings of the moves simply because those are not always available. And you know, five or so years ago, they weren't necessarily reliable either. So I, I, uh, so my model is based on hundreds of thousands of games between players of all ratings, but the sources for those games don't even give the time control of the tournament, let alone the times for individual rules. So I have no basis on which to model for contrast, so I just ignore that data. I have two questions about this. If chess.com is looking for how many moves did this player make that was exactly what a computer would make, there's two questions about that. One is, A, what if a player, knowing what Viswanathan Anand said about you only need one move, what if a player only does this every 10 moves or, or doesn't yeah. take the top suggestion, takes the fourth suggestion each time? That's a real challenge. Yeah. So, so there's one mathematical thing that helps. So we all know the term flying under the radar, which is what you're describing. But... In the physical, flying under the radar means you can keep a constant altitude, okay? But in the statistics, you cannot keep a constant at altitude. If you cheat at the same rate, no matter what kind of fraction that rate is, like one-eighth or one-tenth of the time, if you do it long enough, eventually you will catch you statistically. So, so you're saying that one method of detection is to look at many games and see if there's a pattern where someone's always 100% accurate every sixth move. So, or well, not necessarily so regular. Instead, what I have is I'm able to measure the amount of discrepancy. And the point is that if you keep sending at a constant rate, ultimately the deviation will go up. You have to taper off your sinning at a rate proportional to the one over the square root of the number of moves. I don't think I understand. Like, like stay what, the radar. Yeah, I don't think I understand. So what's the detection technique there? It's just the laws of statistics. So a similar thing, if you have someone who's insider trading or, uh, or you know, making suspicious tra trades, you know, a small number of suspicious trades might fly under the radar. But if the person keeps on making suspicious trades at a constant rate, ultimately it adds up. But so. at, what do you mean by a constant rate? Because you said also the rate might, the, the move, the number of moves they wait before they uh, consult a computer might change. Right, but if but if it, the average stays the same, then the deviation keeps ramping up. So, what do you mean the average stays the same? Well, sorry, if, I'm, if so... the average number of moves uh, could I go by between your consultation of the computer it stays constant, then right. So wouldn't a smart cheater vary up the the number of moves? That... Well, vary it up, but but also as a taper off the global rate. Like maybe, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to give too much advice here, but let's put it this way. Yeah, but, but by you, the way, this is not a guide to cheating. We're just trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in the in Ben Johnson's podcast, I gave a numerical example that basically was to the effect that if you cheat on three moves per game by nine games, I can catch you. I see. But but this leads to the second question. Mm -hmm. Let's say you, Ken Regan, you're an international master. You're a very strong player. Let's say you were playing the average tournament player. You would expect to have almost 100% accuracy to the computer because they're right away going to make weak moves and you will make the obvious 
best move, which is would be the which would probably be the computer move. So, so some and even when two players of equal ability are playing each other, I was just looking yesterday. Two one thousand rated players were playing with eighty four percent accuracy to the computer, yeah. and that's because they're both making equally weak moves. So it's possible to make the best computer. The, the best computer move is also going to be a somewhat not a weak move, but a way an easy way to exploit a weak move will be the best computer move. Yeah, well, it, it is true that the number one case where my results exonerate a player with a high matching percentage to the computer is when the the opponent played a forcing game and left the player only one option to stay alive or only one option to win. And chances are a strong player and a computer are both going to find that necessary move. This was the case with the original toilet gate accusation in 2006 to Paolo versus Kremnik in the world championship match. And it was in particular in game two, the, the fact that to was winning beautifully and then uh, did not press his advantage. And then a uh, lost was, I think the most upsetting thing to the Bulgarians. And it is true that for the last 32 of the 64 moves of the game, I reproduced claims that Kramnik matched over 90%, but most of those moves were completely forced. So this is in public on my website, along with in bold green, the statistical principle involved. And in 16 years since, I've not had any reason to change it. And yet there are some kinds of moves that a computer will make that are very non-human-like. For instance, they can make a move that seems obscure, but 11 moves later, you realize why it was important, but you know, no, no human would have calculated why right. that move would have been important. So how do you know, like, it seems like it would be easy to, to detect cheating if you could detect any of those moves, but it's very d difficult to determine whether a move is computer-like or human-like. Right. It is. What's interesting is I have gone for the minimalist approach of trying to infer that organically only from the numbers. So I have an objective non-chess based measure of when a position is difficult or complex. And so I'm hoping to detect smart cheating by using a distribution that upweights complex positions and downweights positions with easy choices. So if it's not a forcing sequence, but there is a move that is significantly, like the first choice is significantly better than all the other choices, you would weight that more. That's right. Although. If it's a dead end game where there are 10 moves that are equal, but they all lead to draws, then I have to downweight that as well. So I actually weight by the amount of hazard in the position, the, by the, the probability and magnitude of losses that a misstep may incur. And that's the type of position when you would most want to call on a lifeline. So, um, so that, that's my idea anyway. I did all this work in 2019, but in the pandemic for online chess, the one drawback of that approach is that by clumping the distribution, I increased the denominator of the Z-score, making the model a little less sharp. Okay, so what does that mean? So it means that if, if, you, if, you, if you clump up a distribution, the standard deviation goes up. And that standard deviation is your basic yardstick. You're, you're talking in multiples of that. So if I have a deviation of, say, a three and a half sigma the old way, and I use a larger deviation, like using a meter instead of a yard as my yardstick, then my score is only three meters instead of three and a half yards. And, and that means my, my uh, statistical score is going to be less. So unless a person really is smart cheating, the work needed to make my, my program detect smart cheating actually makes it a little duller. So during the pandemic and online chess, uh, there, I definitely got results that were sharper with my simple unit weight approach rather than the smart cheating design to approach. Translation, so, mm -hmm. in online chess during the pandemic, I encountered a lot of dumb cheating. I see people who were just every move using the computer. Yeah, or, or using it in bursts, but not with discrimination as to when they felt they would need the help. So and, whereas what Anand is talking about is a position like you could play bishop takes h7 check, but you don't know if it works. 
give me one bit of information on whether that move works. Right, right. And that's the smart cheating approach when you know a critical position and you consult a computer. Right. And so I guess a third question is, and this occurs due to the pandemic and also is related to this current chess cheating scandal with a player named Hans Niemann. During the pandemic, a lot of young people, and Hans Niemann was, was, is a teenager still, a lot of young people very quickly improved because they had more time to study during the pandemic. And then the difference between 2020 and 2022, when they start playing in tournaments, they might have had a huge leap in rating that would not have that, that, that defies kind of statistical right. planning. So this is where I would like to share my screen. So what you've just touched on has been the number one scientific activity that I've had to do during the pandemic. So start screen share, if I may have position. So I should say one other thing about myself. Um, I co-write one of the major blogs in computing. It was a top 55 blog roundup uh, two years ago, and we were in the top quartile of it behind publisher sites. This is the blog started by Professor Richard J. Lipton, Emeritus of Georgia Tech at Princeton. We have co-authored a textbook on quantum computing with MIT Press. So this blog has over a thousand posts uh, in it. Wow. Um, I could mention Tyler Cowlett has sometimes referenced this blog. Uh, so he's a childhood friend as well, of course. Also, and, uh, also a, a former New Jersey State champion uh, around the same age as you, and you're both from right. New Jersey. So we, we were on winning Garden State Chess Association four teams uh, in the uh, or you, what became the U.S. Amateur East, uh, for yeah. instance. Yeah, so yeah he, he's been time. on the podcast quite a bit. Yep. So, so anyway, um, so this is an article that I wrote. So, um, so one of the realities of the pandemic is that because online chess is not officially rated, ratings of, of aspiring, you know, growing junior players flatlined. Okay. So for instance, this is Annie Wang who won the uh, U.S. junior female section last year. So the point is I estimated with a back of the envelope formula, but it's been surprisingly accurate where Annie Wang's real rating really should be. So I had her up around 2480 at the time I was doing this tournament. And the real challenge is to be able to tell, it's not so much at the top end, the real challenge is to be able to tell for really young players that they are in this kind of explosive growth curve. So one example I could mention is, is at an in-person tournament, junior tournament in Asia, a kid was on the wall chart at 1595 and he was beating 2100s, 2200 players. And I got contacted about this. Um, but I just said, you know, my, my pandemic lag adjustment formula places him already at 2100. So it's not a surprise he's beating 2200s. So it's catching people here. And I can't tell whether I'm accurate for a given player, but for tournaments en masse, I have been incredibly accurate, including for the Olympiad, especially in the female section. There are uh, were a lot of junior teams, including, I think, New Zealand or one of the Ocean Pacific teams had all junior players. So I put my adjustment rating adjustment formula and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, it's 28 months of the pandemic out. So it's a really extrapolating, but it was still it was four to five times more accurate than what you would get if you didn't use the adjustments. Uh, and that means closer. And actually for the women at the Olympiad, my screening average screening score was 50.00, exact bullseye. With, so with, so with the do adjustment. You, does your cheating algorithm, your, your cheating detection algorithm take into account rating? Like if someone's playing above, like statistically significantly above their rating level? Right. Now, for when it gets to a full test stage, then I consult with people, in fact, to get the most accurate fix on the rating, not just what my formula gives. But I, I screen uh, you know, uh, 10,000 games a week, or not quite 10,000 games wow. a week. Uh, you know, the week in chess says, and chess base updates of 5,000 games each with considerable overlap. So I get all the, I get these massive tables so I can tell that on average, my formula is working just right for those massive tables. So, and yeah. how often do you detect a cheater where nobody asked you to detect a cheater? 
I, yeah, that's a good question. I, and the problem is I, with my responding to that is I can't definitely say the person was a cheater because often this is not followed up. So I'll just say I detect high outliers and inform about them and sometimes they're followed up and sometimes they're not. And is this for offline or for online tour? mean live tournaments or online tournaments? Both. And there are some people, there are some cases. Well, in fact, I just brought two players to chess.com's attention last week. So. And are they like high rated title players? I mean, I'm not looking for names, but I'm just curious how prevalent is cheating at, let's say the highest levels. It's all over the place. So that is unbelievable. I, mean, I wouldn't say not in the elite, you know, not in the 2600 plus, but you know, there are, there have been a couple of, uh, of, uh, cases of people being sanctioned at, uh, at 2600 plus level that are in the public record. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not gonna be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take 
one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So let's take a look at the Hans Neiman case. So yeah. again, what happened was is that Magnus Carlson lost a game to Hans Neiman. So several things about it were interesting. One is Magnus Carlson was white. It's it's very unusual for Magnus Carlson to lose a slow rate of game with the white pieces. Not only that, he had just gone 53 games in a row, which is unbelievable, mm -hmm. 53 games in a row without a loss. And this was his loss to a, a person rated roughly 200 rating points lower than him. And Magnus was playing the white pieces. Also, Magnus had apparently had heard about Hans cheating years earlier, I guess, at chess.com. It was unclear whether it was years earlier or more recent, so we still don't know. But there was some communication between chess.com and Magnus right after the game. And Magnus dropped out, with a, not saying why, but with a video saying, basically, I can't say why I'm dropping out or I'll get in trouble. He, he, he referred to another video of, in another sport of someone saying that. And so there's been wild speculation. Was, was he, A, was he accusing Hans Niemann of cheating? B, was the cheating that Hans Niemann somehow knew Magnus's specific book preparation? Or was Hans cheating in that particular game? Or was there more just general cheating that Hans had been involved in so Magnus was disgusted and didn't want to play anymore? There's been all this speculation. And every day there's new speculation. So the most recent one being this morning, I saw that Hans does significantly better on games where the moves are transmitted, you know, when they're live games, the games where the moves are transmitted to the public, as opposed to games where they're not transmitted. Hans himself has admitted cheating when he was 12 and 16 online. And he also stated that he would never cheat in an over the board game. So I think this summarizes everything we know that's not circumstantial evidence. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence out there that is meaningless. Yeah. And by the way, I want to also state for the record, I admire Hans Niemann as a player and I hope this is all proven false and that everything is good. He, he's a very interesting personality and, and whether you like him or not and, and his games are, are amazing. And also I admire the fact, and I, I want your comment on this a pair, according to Hikaru, Hans Neiman has had the fastest rise at this level of anybody ever at, from, at that age, like even though he's 19, that's still a fairly big age to go from a 24, 80 rating to a 27, 20 rating. And so, so that's, one of Nakamura's circumstantial evidence that there might be suspicion warranted here. But what, what, what's your feeling on that? And then just in general, we'll, we'll get okay, into so, so a bunch of things here. So I'll just, uh, so I'll first state that uh, I'm still right in the middle of data analysis here. So there are some things I can't say, not because I don't feel at liberty to say them, but simply because the work has not been done yet. So, okay. So that, that, that's number one. Can you say what work hasn't been done yet? Oh, uh, uh, sifting a lot of this metadata. For instance, the, uh, the the thing you mentioned is from this morning, which I saw yesterday about the, the tournaments broadcast versus non-broadcast, where he does better. And also this other question about spurts by, um, you know, suddenly from, from uh, you know, 24, 60, uh, 20, 700 being unprecedented. I think I saw a response for that, but I've not even had time to uh, to go through the details on that. So I'll work from the parameters of what's publicly known and 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 what's definitely what's settled at this moment. Stay away from the things where it's unclear even in my own work. 
Uh, so first of all, the organizers released a statement on Saturday uh, saying that both they and I, I've been in official consultation with the uh, tournaments in St. Louis, in fact, the entire Grand Chess Tour series uh, from the beginning, um, and we have not found any evidence or indication of over-the-board type cheating, engine type cheating. Over the board in this tournament. In this tournament, that's right. And and, and again, you you look at all the moves. You look at the relationship between what the computer would have played, or second move, or third move, and what Hans played. And is it different than what Hans normally would have played? And you found. Well, that that that's a separate matter. So one thing about it is that my model has no chess knowledge built into it. No, that's that's uh, on purpose to avoid potential bias. The danger of bias is far greater than the lack of knowledge Sure, from that. And in fact, sometimes I don't even look at the game so as not to prejudice my own uh, you know, understanding of the case. So anyway, I mean, remember I said that with the, with the Kramnik game that I reproduce a high concordance to the computer, but the game was quite clear cut. Okay, so this is the similar things operate here. How, how do you define clear cut if you if there's no bias? Clear cut when there is one clear standout move, uh, and but but again, a, one clear standout move could be impossible for a human to figure out, or it could be easy for a human to figure yeah, out. Yeah, that's right. Now this is the hardest part of my model. So uh, my model does try to ascertain when the best move will be especially difficult to find, such as when when there are other moves that are very tempting, and in fact. For about for one out of seven or one out of eight moves over players of all ratings, even the highest ratings, it does project to put the highest likelihood on an inferior move. And that gives me about two to three percentage points advantage in predictivity. So for instance, with, with a you know 2,700 rated player. If I just predicted that the player would make the computer's best move, I'd be right 57% of the time. But if I use my model to sometimes predict inferior moves and judge when in the most difficult or complex positions, then I can get 59 to 60% hit rate. So if you want to bet on chess games, my model is absolutely what you should use if you think that 2% is enough of a return on your investment. And um, uh, and there, there are a couple of other things that might surprise you. So, if, so if you don't mind me going into a screen sharing uh, riff again? No, um, I'll, I'll read what's on the screen for the okay. benefit of people. So this listening. is a po article I wrote when I settled my model in summer 20, uh, 2019 uh, related to betting on horse races. So if you want to read that angle, this is it. And, and so my old model used to always put the highest probability on the top move, which is the favorite. Now, this is an experiment. When you say probability, probability of what? It's a predictive analytic model. So it treats the moves, legal moves in the chess positions as the events and puts a probability figure on a player of a given rating making the, a, a given move. So what I'm looking at here is um, the top move uh, for someone rated what is 17? So, so this is a controlled experiment. So yeah. I took all uh, uh, took uh, you know six thousand positions in my main training set, where the player to move was rated between one thousand and twelve hundred feet, in. and it was a position with many reasonable choices. At least ten moves valued within a quarter point of optimum. Okay, so so moves where the information gained by choosing the computer's best move is most considerable. Okay. Now, this is like crowdsourcing the number. Wait, wait, wait. I, I have a question about that. If 10 moves are valued relatively similar to each other, what the computer says doesn't even really matter. I can choose any of those moves. That's what you'd think, right? Well, what right. you're looking at are the empirical results. So these very weak chess players, well, I'd say very weak, you know, but um, they nevertheless found the computer's best move one sixth of the time certainly 14 percentage points better than the 10th best move, which was only a quarter point worse. And if, so if the evaluations really don't matter, then these moves should, these percentages should be all near 10% or near equality. Okay, I mean, they're weak chess players, so 
25%, they play a move outside the top 10, uh, a blunder. But the main point is that this refutes the idea that weaker players prefer weaker moves. No, if you get enough weaker players and crowdsource them, they will still, with 4.5 percentage points clearance, uh, uh, pick the, the, the top ranked move. Okay. And why is that? What's just philosophically what's happening there? Because we, because, because it, there's a, an error, a noisy process by which we apprehend quality in chess. And we all have some basic notion of quality. And there are things that interfere or keep us unable to get the full truth of that quality. Nonetheless, you know, even a novice stock trader, okay, will occasionally make a good trade. And more often, and moreover, we'll have some idea of what feels in the gut to be a good idea, even if the player doesn't do the real deep research to see if that's really so. So, you know, a, a, a novice stock trader may be at a disadvantage competing against uh, well-armed people, but if it were a novice stock trader against the entire realm, range of society without these tools, uh, with chess is modeling a little more, the, the you know, in, in a boom time, the average stock trader will do reasonably well. Okay, You don't have the phenomenon that in a reasonable upmarket time, average stock traders are going to make terrible choices. Okay, right. They might not do as well as the brains, but... That's why the stock market's publicly accepted, because in the main, uh, John Q. Public has, has done fairly well. And the doing fairly well is the kind of distribution you're seeing here. Well, not the bottom line. Okay, so, um, so instead, what my work says makes a blunder in chess is when you're diverted by a shiny object. In other words, conned by the chess position. Okay. And uh, so that's so that's the uh, that's the approach to it. Now let me stop sharing screen. Get back to uh, to what you're talking about. So that's that's the phenomenon that I'm trying to capture in my uh, souped up model. Um, so clear cut, therefore, means that there's not a lot of cases where my program is picking up the diversion in a chess position. In other words, what I'm saying is that. This, as far as my model can detect, just from the way move values jump around, that's that's the key. It looks at lower depth values and see how much they jump around. The strategy for Neiman in that position was fairly clear cut. Why is an isolated pawn gang up on it, win it, defend against the seventh rank counterattack? And there was one really nice move, E3, sacrificing a pawn so the knight gets to E4 and white suddenly threatened with checkmate. But Carlson tried to create a distraction with G4, and it turns out that that was his worst move of that. Uh, he was punished for trying to create a distraction. So there weren't many distractions for Black, and that's what my model is picking up. And how does your model determine what those shiny... So, so basically, a blunder happens after a shiny object like G4, like Carlson's G4, yep. and if he doesn't do the blunder... Does that suggest, I'm trying to figure out what suggests unusual play. Yeah, that's right. So, so that, well, that, yeah, uh, well, avoiding a real trap could be unusual play. Another question about what you just said. Yeah. Did you just use chess bias in your description of the game? Like, yes, you might know that in an isolated queen pawn position, the, the, these six moves are clear cut, but yeah. how do you, how does the computer distinguish whether it's easy, clear cut, or difficult. Well, that's what I try to do organically, so I'll show you. But you're right. I mean, I play the C3 Sicilian as white, so I often had the same split pawn, pawn structure Carlson uh, had. And if I... If, if Note I, to self, when playing Blitz against Ken Regan, prepare for C3 Sicilian. Yes, and, and trade queens if you can, and gang up at my isolated C pawn. Okay. So this now is an example. This is by student, by the way, Tamal Bishwash, who's now on, on the faculty of, of, of RKM Ferry in Kolkata, India. He's from Bangladesh originally. So this was one of the main pivots of his thesis. So this is the uh, key moment in the 2008 World Championship match between okay. Kramnik White and Anand Black in this position. So the question is, 
Can white capture Black's tea point? Okay. So now a beginning player will say, no, Black's queen is on. Okay. Slightly stronger, deeper play will say, hey, wait a second. Uh, if Black's queen takes it, I can move my rook, and I'm skewering Black's queen to the knight, and I'll get my piece back. In fact, I might win the bishop too. Now, deeper player getting into your level will say, uh-oh, wait a second. Black can counterattack with knight f6 on my queen and move the knight out of trouble. But now, world championship level player, at least Kramnik fell into this, will say, ah, but after I take the queen and Black's knight takes my queen, I can go down here and get the bishop. Then I've got two healthy pass pawns on the queen side. Moreover, my bishop is defending my back rank, so I should be okay. Okay, I almost fell for that one. <laughs> yes, there you go. Well, Kramnik played into it, and he did not see what was coming until Anand executed on the board. Anand had seen a little further, and there was knight e3 attacking the bishop, and after pawn takes knight, pawn takes pawn, white's rook is completely out of position to Ugh. guard against the e-pawn coming down for checkmate. See, this is why chess is like a, a beautiful work of art. Like that, people can't see this position, um, and for many people it might not matter, but if you watch the video of this, we'll put the video on YouTube. This is just a beautiful, beautiful move at the end of this. And I could easily see how anyone can miss this, even a world championship level player. And what my model relies upon is that the computer at lower depths cannot see it either. So this was Stockfish 6, you know, current Stockfish in 2015. And at depth 9, the pawn capture it thinks is initially bad. But at depth nine, it jumps up to 0 0.77. And it stays in you know, the range of a little over half of a pawn until depth 14. So that's a pretty considerable so stretch. Just looking 14 moves ahead. Right, looking 14 half moves, that's seven full moves ahead. And then seven and a half moves ahead, suddenly it goes to minus 181 because it has seen uh, Anand's track. So this is the shiny object causing a diversion. So this is the case where my model will upweight the probability of falling into the trap. Basically then, if someone makes a move where it suggests they've seen, so first there's a, a, a move that the computer can make where it's wrong, 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 wrong. Then it switches, then it switches back massively around yeah. 15 moves deep or more. And if someone makes a move like that, that could suggest cheating or if someone responds accurately to a move like that it could suggest cheating any anything around this move that's right it's getting deep information and there are people who are trying to assess this directly which might be work you know on the scale of a single player but for the betting and validation of my model i need to make sure that its scores stay within the normal distribution on massive amounts of data so I had to program a way to do it organically, just from the recorded engine values at various depths, not on any notion of chess knowledge of what's a deep position, because unless I paid the entire army of master players in the world to annotate hundreds of thousands of games that way, I just could not get the training data. So, so wait, it, it's, is this a distribution issue, like a statistics issue, or like right here, I'm looking at what you showed as the computer valuation. Again, for 14 moves, the computer was wrong. And then at the 15th move, it suddenly saw this amazing thing. Now, most people, and, and by the way, it was massively wrong. It was like a, a two, three, three point, three pawn difference, essentially. So, so do you really need a distribution or should you just look at every game which has people making moves that yeah, mimic? So that's true. So the distribution, so there's one distribution of values over the moves that I get organically. But what I'm talking about for making sure that my model is reliable, that I don't go accusing people with incorrect justification, I need to attend to the, to the mass distribution of honest players and the statistics that they generate, including the fact that occasionally, you know, once every, you know, 30,000 entrance of a player into an event, that player is going to have a four sigma up, lucky day. Well, it, it could be the case too that 
they do in that particular case, they make the move and then they think, oh my God, I just blundered. And, but then as the game continues, they right. finally see the correct move. Right. So, so there's, so, so that's those, probably those explains. things happen. And yeah. I do re a statistical randomized resampling of my training sets in millions of validation trials to make sure that it may happen, but it doesn't happen so often as to throw off the conformance of my model to the bell curve for uh, the great mass of honest players. But then let's take, let's take on and Kramnik. They're both world champions right. and mm -hmm. they clearly can make a move like that because they did make, right. Anand did make that move. And, but your system wouldn't accuse him of cheating because you have statistically analyzed his level of play players games and they will make those moves occasionally or how right. do you do that that's that's uh, so they are yes so that's so the point is they're they're high rated so among the ba most basic things that i do so i'm going to share my screen again uh so more more articles on this blog and i must say the blog is a pre-publication venue so th these things should go in papers but the pandemic kept me so busy <laughs> that i only had time to do this in fact I have not had time to write an article about uh, Ali Riza Feruzda's ultra bullet marathon and how that plays into my statistics. Um, oh, oh, okay. I'm yeah, talk yeah about I that analyze later. that. So yeah. let's take the Hans Niemann for a second, but then that's fascinating. Yes. But so, um, so here's the point. So this is a good statistical thing for stock market charting as well. So this is how bit, roughly how my data stood, you know, 10 years ago when my reliable data was in the 1600 to 2700 range. And what you're looking at is the percentage first line match versus a player's rating. So I said, you know, a 2700 player will match about 57% of the time, there it is. Okay, but a, a 2200 player, so here, will match the first line of the computer only right around 50%. Which and, is fascinating because you're saying then the difference between a, a, a 2200 and what is that high, highest number, 2640 or 2540? Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're saying the difference between a, a, a master and like a super grandmaster is only 8% difference in terms of how they'll. Yeah, only hit 8 the percentage match. points. That's why gaining uh, 2 percentage points advantage is huge. Okay. And I guess it's because most moves are clear cut. Like the first five moves, for instance, of a game are always clear cut. You're always, you can, it's right. easy to make the top move. Uh, and then maybe it, it's really almost around moves 20 to 40 that are mm -hmm. the, you're going to find a critical position. It almost would be interesting to just look at moves 20 to 40 because I bet those percentages would change a lot. It, that's true. Now, that is, that is a fact that, 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 that there is a, an important sensitivity on the uh, index of the move of the game, which I tried to average over, but ah, that's a really messy area. So let me pretend yeah. you didn't ask that. Okay, uh, it might, that might be relevant per opening, or it, it is a lot of a lot more factors that are, are messy. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of messy sausages in my shop here. But um, the a not sporting analogy I can make from having seen the US Open yesterday is that, um, you know, weak players do often play the best move of, in a position, and it's like holding serve in tennis. You know, a clearly inferior tennis player nevertheless does expect to win more than 50% of his or her own service games, uh, unless it was the match of Iga Swantek against Jesse Pagula over a 13th break <laughs> serve. Okay, now anyway, the point I'm saying here is this looks like a perfect linear relationship. It's got an R squared of 0.99. In the social sciences, you kill for something like this. So, so basically, what I'm seeing is there's a straight line from the bottom left to the top right, where as you increase rating, you yeah. you very um, you can see that the higher the rating, the more likely they are to pick the top computer suggested move. Right. So, at a given rating, like let's say 2200, where it's roughly half the time they will pick the top engine rated move. If over a number of games they're at 60 percent instead of 50 percent. There's only two conclusions. One is either they're cheating, or two is they're underrated and they're during a period of massive improvement. I guess. Right. Although there is a third reality that I have to discount in talking about that, and that is the fact that this is actually not a linear relationship, even though it should be, given the design of the rating system. So when I got more data, including data, more data above 2,700, simply put, 
there have been more players with that rating, so they have a lot more games. And with the availability of reliable data under 1,500, what looked like a linear relationship when you wind it is actually clearly curved. And I've had to revise my model to take that into account. But, but that's probably because, I mean, you have to take into account, I mean, this is getting a little into the weeds, but the rating system changes at below certain levels and above certain levels and also based on your age. So for instance, the, the K factor in ELO ratings tightens up after a certain rating level, meaning standard deviations are tighter. And I wonder if you take that into account. It might be. I mean, uh, it, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know the, the root cause underneath yet. All I know is, is, is that I've had to take this into account. I mean, it looks to me that the, I mean, the younger players are more volatile because their improvement could be faster. So that's why it doesn't work as well at the very lower level. And at the higher level, the difference between a 2650 and a 2600 might be a full standard deviation as opposed to a 200 point difference. Right. And now one thing is in terms of estimating, there is that the fact of higher rating uncertainty at lower ratings does bump up the standard deviation. And this has also been the case during the pandemic, you know, with official ratings frozen, there's a lot more uncertainty in my rating estimations for individual players. And that has bumped up my sigma. And that sigma of, of bumps up in a way that is linear with the amount of data, amount, number of games a player has played, rather than square root. So it's a real pain. So, so it's very interesting. So if someone's improving quickly, um, obviously their rating will adjust fairly quickly as well. But after the pandemic, when we went back to over the board, it could be the case, like you mentioned earlier, someone 1,500 can now be 2,100 in scale. Right. And at younger ages, that tends to happen more often than at higher ages. Mm -hmm. There also could be something where if someone just learned an opening and now they're playing that opening perfectly, even though they're still 1500, suddenly their computer accurate moves will bump up for that opening. Right. And that's another fact that's especially important at fast chess, which is that the amount of book knowledge has increased. So the average novelty is now a move or so later than it was when I started 10 or so years ago. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm trying... I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works travels and or cares about looking and feeling great as you could tell by my many photos across the internet i care about looking fantastic i'm practically a model and let's be honest every guy loves to look great so again shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20 percent when you spend 130 dollars or more using promo code james that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what, where your costs are, where your revenues are, where, where your payments are. 
teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. This gets to a kind of a, another um, prong of online cheating, which is they could simply have the book in front of them sometimes and not the book in front of them other times. And you could probably detect that. Like, so if someone plays a certain opening and they, and they get the top computer move 50% of the time, but there's like one day where five games in a row, they were 60%, you could suggest that could suggest that they don't have a computer in front of them, but they're simply reading the course right in front right. of them. Yeah. That, that's, and that's, that is also, by the way, the fact that prep is on no. So prep comes into play in a further iteration after I give my original report. But now let's wend back to the Neiman case because I think this is the crucial element. Yes. So in the game, Neiman versus Carlson, and I can find it quickly if you, I'll show it on the screen in a moment. Um, so in that game, uh, the official novelty was Carlson's queen takes D4. This is using chess base cloud and my chess base uh, updates. And uh, so, and so, so I just want to mention for, to set context, uh, and I'm not right now we're not, he's, Ken is not screen sharing. We're not looking at the game, but what I know of this game is that many people claimed that Carlson had never played this opening before. And Hans in the interview right afterwards said it was by miracle that he had studied and prepared for this opening because people were not, I want, I don't want to say suspicious. They were, it was just unusual that he would have prepared for a game that an opening that Magnus never played, but apparently Magnus has played, as Han said, Magnus has played transpositions of this opening before. So they've, he has reached the, roughly the same position at least twice before. Right. I don't know. I have not checked this myself, but yeah. I believe Hans on why so, would he not, why so would he say that? I think that? the key element is exactly to ask what was the nature of this miracle? But I will say that, um, so here's the game. And uh, so I'll scroll through the opening. Uh, so it's a Nimzo Indian defense, but white plays G3. Hey, Oleg Romanish had played like this when we were on student team championships together in the 1970s. Uh, for, we played for what was then the Soviet Union. You're you're old school chess player. So you were playing with um, Fedorowicz back then, probably, yeah. uh, when he was a junior, and, and Joel Benjamin, Danny Michael Kobe, Wilder. Danny Kobeck, Kim Commons, yeah. So, um, uh, John, yeah, Fedorowicz, Tisdall. Um, so anyway, okay. So it's now actually has more of the character of a Cadillac. Uh, and black is counterattacking in the set to or sometimes happens. Now queen takes d4 rather than taking with the knight or pawn. Just to describe, like, it's not critical for understanding this case, but I, we are looking at the game, Carlson versus Neiman. It's it's sort of the, the moves themselves are not that important, except we'll, it'll help me to explain when we get to the critical position. Right. I'm just saying for, That's the, right. for the so, audience. Sake. So this is the official novelty. So what follows is prep. Uh, a novelty is a move that has apparently never been played before during a tournament. Not in the databases, at least not of elite games. I use a policy of taking moves by players rated 2,300 and above 
a similar distinction as was made by the opening master disc series. So uh, anyway, okay. So now uh, Carlson regains his pawn. Now black, however, strikes into the center. And here we have, by the way, the isolated C pawn. So the question is, can white generate an initiative, especially with the two bishops, to offset black's structural advantage? So black puts the question, and now white attacks black's queen, and this is the key move. If black has to move the queen, then white can continue generating an initiative. But as Niemann said, he reviewed before the game, he knew that black has to counterattack with bishop e6. Which by itself is not unusual for players at this level to do what's called a Zwischenzug or an intermediate move. So, right. so one piece is being attacked, but rather than defending it and just reacting to your opponent mindlessly, you make a move that also is an attack. So it's, a, it's an intermediate move rather than a gut reaction. Right. In general, there's a little bit of risk because white's queen could move and attack something else, and then black would have the queen and something else attacked. But in fact, there's no way for white to really take advantage of this. Like this, this move uh, doesn't work. I don't know exactly how black deals, but then I guess I can ask uh, the computer and the computer says black plays we, we cheat. queen a5 is the right way to, to deal with that. Well, okay. Um, at any rate, Carlson took this, took this, and then on the 15th move, Carlson thought for a long time, clearly out of his depth. And what's actually happened is that White's initiative has been squelched. Carlson actually took this and took this. So Black has double pawns on the king side, but they're really not an issue. The issue is this Isolani and the fact that White has to skulk with his king to defend e2 and then defend the open file. So, so, so again, just to describe, on move 15, on move 14, I guess, there was the novelty. On move 15, move, Hans move made... 10, the official novelty... Move 13, the, the definite important preparation move. Right, and, and, and Hans, who said after the game and before, but before the cheating accusations that he had had this position on his board before the game because yeah. he was studying this, he, he came up with kind of a counterattack, and it all boils down. Both sides end up with weaknesses, and it boils down to which weakness is more important, and Hans had determined, I guess, in preparation that... Magnus Carlsen's weakness was more critical than Black's weakness. And yeah. this was the the innovation that kind of led to the rest of the game, right. which earlier you described as the rest of the game is roughly clear cut. Like now there's a kind of plan of what you do against these types of weaknesses. And the isolated pawn is a worse weakness than the slightly weakened king in an end game and the doubled pawns. Yeah. And players prepare with engines. So you doubtless could see that Stockfish 15 the depth 26, which is a higher depth than I used, well, not always, but uh, but to pretty nice high depth, gives black the better side of what still classes as an equal position. So three, right, it's still roughly equal, yeah. but it's it favors Hans, but it's 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 any this would be ignored in most computer analysis as being better for black or better for white. Like it's not better enough that you would say black is winning. Yeah, and there's also what. Um, Jacob Agard or some other, I, there's not someone else, calls the zone of one mistakes or the slippery slope before you get to the zone of one mistake. And this is a great example. The most natural human move to make is to guard your e-pawn. But in fact, right. Stockfish is saying there are three moves better than guard your e-pawn. It's time to jettison your e-pawn and start thinking about counterplay. So in other words, the computer so, but, is by saying, the way, my my only instinct was to guard the e pawn. I might add. Yeah, but the computer is saying it's time for White to uh, to make a concession and start thinking about counterplay. So that in itself is, in human and chess terms, a significant fact on the ground. So now it's saying half a point advantage to Black, and okay, well the other thing that I my model has to deal with is that computer values jump around. Oh, it says actually that rook d8 was not the right move to play. So, I mean, I'd, I certainly say that Neiman is not cheating with Stockfish 15 in this position because what the computer is saying is you should have played your knight a5 strategy first and then decide where, which file to put the rook on. Instead, Neiman played here, allowed white to improve the king, then move the knight, 
and then move the rook to a different square. So you can see that over those three moves, black actually lost the tempo. So this suggests that given that this was the critical position where a computer is most, I guess you could define the critical position as those positions where the computer is most useful as opposed to a human brain. Right. And so in this, this is clearly a critical position that the whole board has just transformed. And that almost, that's kind of what defines a critical position. And, and this is where a computer would have been useful. And here's where Hans makes his weakest moves. Yeah. So it suggests that he was not cheating over the board here. Right. But now uh, Magnus played the second best move, giving up the pawn right away when knight e4 was also moved to consider. Uh, but he gave the pawn right away because he sees that he can get black's bishop for it. Why can't black take the pawn with the knight? That's a good question. What happens if I take the pawn with the knight? Probably something really bad. In fact, actually, the computer, Stockfish, is saying that black shouldn't grab the pawn yet at all. The pawn's going to fall. Why improve your position first? Well, the, the, the bishop takes pawn attacking uh, the rook. Yes, bishop takes pawn attacking the rook and then steady. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, good. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, anyway, so bishop takes pawn. That was a little premature by Hans. And, um, and, that, and that could even be, you know, you could say youthful exuberance. He's, he's, beating, he's got a better game against the world champion. Yeah. So, White got counterplay. And, uh, you know, so this, this is, this is, Black's knight is sort of governed by White's bishop. I want to address that too, because after the game, again, there was a lot of people giving may, mostly circumstantial evidence that there was cheating involved. A lot of people said it was unusual for Magnus to not have any chances at all. But we see here, White did, Magnus did have some counterplay. He had some chances. Yeah. Yeah. He's, well, he should, yeah so he should play Rook D8. So because F5, and now play here. You know, this is do some weakness. And if White plays F3, that's the right way to break up Black's pawn chain. Magnus did this instead. And now the problem is, is that uh, by White not having an escape square that F3 would have made, now actually Black can very effectively start uh, depriving White's bishop of squares. So this bishop is actually uh, is, is starved at the moment. So, so, okay, so here's the critical question. This is move 20, yeah. um, where did G4 occur? Move 28? Move 28, yeah. So the critical question is, or, or move 29, or no, move 28. Yeah. The critical question is, this is a crucial position where Magnus is offering up a shiny object. Most people would take that shiny object in a regular yeah. mm -hmm. blitz game or whatever. Um, and Hans didn't. So what suggests to you that there was no cheating, you know, when he didn't take that shiny object? Obviously he knew that Magnus is planting a trap because it even looks like a trappy sort of move. Um, yes, so that's right. So, um, do, do, do you're saying that the 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 Magnus is your G4 looks like a trap. Yeah, Magnus maybe maybe was still thinking, well, I have better pawn structure and I've got a bishop against the knight. So if I open up the game, I'll be able to at least equalize, but maybe even have chances again. Um, but here, however, though, Magnus would have been well advised, as the computer is saying, to remember the proverb taught to every Russian schoolboy. Yeah. Ladnina Inchpili Sigrani Venichno. All rook end games are drawn. So Magnus should have uh, whipped off the knight and, and and started going toward making a draw. Um, but instead, Magnus moved. Right, because moved it was kind of e almost equal, slightly better for black, but almost equal, like right. equalish. Whereas and but maybe he wanted to, you know, he goes for the win. He's one thing that makes him world champion is he goes for a win in equal positions or slightly down positions. He's known for that. And he, people fall into his traps, but could it be the case? How would you identify Hans as to be not cheating when in the moves that followed after G4, after the potential trap? Yeah, well, that, that at least in this run of Stockfish 15, he did not always play Stockfish's best move. He made slight, very human mistakes. And that's kind of what my model picks up in the official run. So another issue that I deal with quite in general is that there's no such thing as, quote, the computer's move. The move values are a distribution. For instance, here, Hans played a humanly wonderful move. And I would say that's definitely the best move. But in this trial of Stockfish 15 to Depth 22, Stockfish 15 actually prefers the night move 
allowing white to get into a rook ending again, you know, but you know, better than, than where it was before. But still, I would say that, that if you allow, um, uh, well, I guess the, the, the you know, computer is saying that bishop takes c4 is really lost for white. So what I know. Okay. Um, at any rate, but if you run the computer to a slightly different depth, I bet there would be a depth where e3 is the best move. Well, let me ask you a question. Was E3 not the best move? Like right now, the computer is at depth 22. Yeah. At depth five, was E3 in the running? At depth 10, was E3 in the running? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Let's see if I can copy the uh, the move code of the position. quickly. Because that's what you were suggesting earlier, is that if the first 15 moves, something like E3 doesn't show up, but then suddenly it shows up as the best move, and then Hans plays it, that's suggestive of cheating. But if E3 was always one of the top three suggestions from move one, it's a move like any other. Yeah, that's right. Let's see. I clicked computer analysis. That just, that just toggled it off. Let's see. Is, is there a quick way to get the... Uh, the uh, you, you could start analyzing the position from def one, right? Yeah, I, I could. Indeed, I'm just, I'm just trying to... I, I have the arena chess engine, chess uh, interface, all where I have... Well, oh, let's see. Wait a second. I have, I'm being very silly here. I can just open up my copy of the games uh so here we go sink field cup and um carlson neiman so now let me go to this position what move is it it's um move 32 okay so now yeah. move 32 um move 32 was the e3 yeah so is, oh you move 32 oh, yeah. black okay so yeah. now i this is stock 15 but let's load another engine so i have all the uh engines and their versions here. Do you have Alpha Zero? Uh, I don't have Alpha Zero, and unfortunately, yeah. I don't have a working PC version of Leela. So, but I, well, I may have LC Zero GPU, but I'm not sure it's really functional. No, let's use Stockfish. Okay, uh, just to see. Stockfish 15, good for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now there are many other little variables here. So, what size of hash table do you want? Do you want it to be two PV mode? Multi PV mode, single PV playing mode. How do you want it? I don't know what those are actually. Oh, those, well, they make a big difference to the distribution of values of moves that you see. Uh, let's run on through four of my processor cores. So we sacrifice scientific reproducibility, uh, but we get a stronger engine. Okay. We just want to see if E3, like the game you showed me with Kramnik and Anand, yeah. that was an impossible move to see okay, for, well, for me. Well, now on this run, the engine is liking E3 clear up through depth 2930. Uh, you're still seeing my screen, right? 32. Yeah. Okay. So it definitely likes E3, which is different from the same stock 15 engine with the 4 PV mode that, uh, that. But what about depth five? Depth five. Let's scroll up to depth five. At depth five, it was knight C4. Look at that. Depth five and six, it wanted knight C4. But that's okay, seven but in a twinkling of an instant, it switched over to E3 for all the rest of the time. And can you see the second and third suggestions at depth three and four and five? Because I'm just sorry, that, curious. I have to change over to multi PD mode, else they won't show. So I'm going to go, go in here. I'm going to clear the hash table so we get a clean run from a fresh start. And now I'll do what chess 24 does and show four variations. Oh, actually, they have three. So I'll show their three. Chess bot used to show four. Okay. Chess24 being the company Magnus owns, by the way. Right. Just to add. Yep. That is being tendered by chess.com. So now, yeah. uh, again, the analysis came out evenly. So at depth four, it thought that Black was completely winning with rook C1 followed by rook A1, but that's silly. Um, okay, but at depth six, it has E, at uh, depth five, it has E3 as the second choice. Oh, uh, yeah. Depth five as second choice and rook C6 protecting the knight is top choice. Then at depth eight and nine, it's it switches over to E3 being the top choice. But so, so it's not unusual for a 2700 or even a 2500 level player to see right. a second choice that's five moves deep. Right. But also notice that here, knight C4, it says it's only one 100th of the point worse at depth 29. Right. So the moves are really uh, co-equal as far as it's concerned. Right, so any variety of moves. So what you're saying there is, is that there were several moves that were winning here. It was hard for Hans to lose here, even if he, whether he had a computer or not. Right, between the two top moves, now they're exactly tied, 1.86. So even though E3 looks like a trickier move, mm -hmm. it really is not 
you know, consequential that it was a trickier move. And in fact, or not. now knight c4 has taken over at depth 32. Right. Oh. So, so, so the evidence that, according to you, is that at least in this one game, and I'm curious if you looked at the other games from this tournament and other hunts over the board tournaments. Yeah. Uh, he's not cheating in this game. He's not. Yeah. That, that, so I. So so I. Yes. Yeah, so so as, as the official press release stated, I did not have any indication of cheating in this game. He played well. But you know, there's there's a large gulf between the threshold for well and the threshold for cheating. What well, what about other Hans games that you've looked at in, I in have recent no months? No evidence of cheating in over the board chess at all. So and, and you've looked at you how many games of his have you looked at? Well, I have screened 106 events counting on walling plus over the board since January 2020. Okay. And no cheating on, and, online and, or offline. And I get a completely normal distribution of ROI. My, my measure. So my ROI screening measure is on the scale of flipping a coin a hundred times with 50 as the expectation and five as the standard deviation. So I have 106 readings. So um, you will, so the standard deviation is five. So one out of every 44 readings, you'll get more than two sigma up. Okay. Uh, so that just happens by natural chance. And uh, so I have a few of those. And just to describe that again, so Hans is expected a certain percentage of the time based on his rating to match the computer's first pick. Right. And it's not unusual in some games for him to be two standard deviations away from that or two standard deviations below that. Right. And But, but I'm saying also this is by entries on this table are counting his complete performance on the available games from a tournament. And important to point out, for a lot of the European tournaments, they don't post all their games. They post only the games that are broadcast. So my sample is definitely biased toward broadcast games. And yet, I have a completely normal bell curve with median 49.8 out of 106 readings of hands. Uh, oh, that's counting as online and uh, and over the board. I could restrict it to just over the board, but I could probably get a similar result. I mean, again, and let, let me take play devil's advocate just for a second. Mm -hmm. Are you able to, if he's, um, you know, it's w just one move out of the game, would you be able to detect that? One move out of the game? Probably not. But three moves out of the game? I, I did a quantify, quantitative run for Ben Johnson on his part. And and if he picks always the fourth suggestion of the computer, uh, and, would you be able to detect that? Well, sometimes it's a blunder. Uh, yes, I do actually have the top two and top three tests programmed in my system. They're not calibrated, however, though. As it stands, they're slightly positively biased. I mean, and, and again, just to try to play the devil's advocate, is there anything you might be missing that would suggest he was cheating over the board like is there any test you would like to do but you can't for even theoretical reasons well yeah so as i said i work in minimal information so uh by the way at depth uh 37 things boomeranged back to knight c4 being the best move so i said my huh. my model takes into account that moves are a distribution from the get-go not any uh, incorrect semantic categories such as quote the computer's move um right so um, at any rate, it, yeah, it's possible. So for instance, if I had how much time, if it's Grishuk playing, I can assume that Grishuk is at time pressure, you have to move 30. And that could influence my determinations. OK, it's a little bit of a swipe, but it's, but it's uh, for. No, no, but that's a good point, because time pressure might, you, maybe you could adjust your algorithm to adjust Grishuk's rating down yeah. now, when he's in time pressure. The most important and most difficult data this is on the tournament stand, is to record times when a player was away from the board, possibly at the bathrooms, or to record times when anything unusual might have been observed or any unusual movements of a player. Uh, this kind of video analysis has been important in some very high-level cases played online, but it can apply over the board as well. And then it is possible that there might be a particular bump of correlation to the player's moves at those independently determined junctions. But that's not what's happening here. You're just saying hypothetically. I have no such information here. 
Right. So for instance, if every time they went to the bathroom, the very next move was higher correlated to the computer than other moves, then that suggests something. Right. And here's the thing, because of a much smaller sample, you know, my Z score, Z score might go down. But the fact of this correlation itself is a different kind of evidence in the Bayesian calculus. Now, let's looking at the other circumstantial evidence, um, is there anything to the fact that his rating has zoomed so much in the in the prior two years? Right. Now that's possible. So one thing I will say is that the formula, according to the pandemic post that I made, lag post, because Neiman played so much that he already had a K factor of 10 uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so my formula projects that from 2465, which was his long frozen rating, um, that he would go to um, 2582. Okay. So in other words, of his rating increase, a little bit more than half is exactly what I would project as something any player of his rating would do. So, so here's his rate, you know, lack of in-person chess the first summer of the pandemic. That's when it's frozen. And then he did go to Europe and was able to play. So that's why he has entries in his uh, in his way. So anyway, so, you know, I, I wish there were a more formal study of these kind of arcs. At any rate, my back of the envelope formula would have put Neem on about where my, or I guess you're not seeing my mouse, about 2,600, right. just 2,582. But but factors in there could be, from what I understand, he had a coach for the first time uh, during this period. Yeah. So 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 the addition of a coach could speed up the increase in rating. He also um, played more. So they looked at. I have seen something where they looked at junior players who made fast streaks up, and if you if you don't do it by years, but by number of games played, mm -hmm. he did have enough games played that it could account for. This, the increase in rating. Right. And it may be that, uh, see, what I think I'm essentially measuring is the amount of time spent improving one's game. And one of the things that ought to become part of a published paper, but it'll take a lot more work, uh, you know, of, of dotting I's and crossing T's, whereas because of my role in the chess world, I'm having to do this in real time, is that online chess, has been just as good for improving one's chess as older offline chess has been. Okay. Well, actually, let me ask you about this. So let's, this is almost a different subject. Yeah. Um, and I do want to ask you the, about this for a few minutes, but let's, let, I want to finish Hans Neiman. So right. over the board and online from January, 2020 on, as far as you could tell, no evidence of any cheating. Right. So given the increases in his rating as they happened, I do not get a large increase. So the important contrast is this is completely different from the picture I had with Igor's Rouses, where you know I I I do up do my updates every week. I have tables with you know for the pandemic approaching three hundred thousand entries. So when I go when I just simply grepped all the lines with Rouses, I saw oh yeah my goodness the vast majority of these are above fifty, and. I'm wondering why chess.com was taking action. And by the way, I love chess.com. Mm -hmm. I think it's a well-managed company and site. I, I actually really think it's a great deal that they're buying the uh, Magnus's company. Mm -hmm. um, that aside, it's it's interesting to me that chess.com chose now to uh, investigate cheating allegations from 2020 on Hans Neiman, you know, when he was 16 years old. Not that that excuses anything, but you know, he's got, well, from 16 to 19, reason, it was 20 percent of his life. So, uh, so yeah. that's the thing. But you know, I, I'm I'm just analyzing the the data. I mean, my my role is just to put the data that has been collected in a scientifically neutral manner out there, so that it can be considered and hopefully avert cases of people rushing to judgment and doing silly things, uninformed things. And this has been a major dialogue with with FIDE, with the International Chess Federation, on the whole that they should take charge of this data so that they have it to hand and can deploy it rapidly and have their own people rather than a university professor who has to prepare lecture notes for a lecture in 90 minutes. Well, uh, and you and you refer to that quite a bit. So I'm curious, why don't you start a company and simply charge for every time you've asked uh, about a cheating allegation? I don't have time for that kind of uh, 
of uh, the infrastructure that I would need to do in order to do that. If you get people who would like to start a company like that on my behalf, that's fine. But I wear three hats, okay? I'm primarily a computational complexity theorist. I do quantum computing. I have a skeptical position in quantum computing. I deal with, I, I'm researching a possible algebraic obstacle, which would amount to be a new physical law that um, may be an impediment towards scaling quantum computers. Now, what are the odds that I'm right? You know, maybe 10,000 to one against. It's, it's probably just silly Ken Regan, you know, not a, not a super top professor, but you know, with some ideas. Uh, nevertheless, yeah, I'll, I'm a, I mean, I'll show you the idea. So you find it on this blog. You just have to uh, search grilling. I've had the idea out there for uh, over a year. So I'm making fun of the fact that there are quantum grills. This is uh, Amlan Chakabarty, who was recently Dean of Computing at the University of Calcutta. But this work was started when he was a grad student visiting Buffalo in 2007. By the way, have you noticed a trend of Indian grad students now moving back to India instead of Silicon Valley after they graduate? Yeah, the world is more mobile in general, yes. so. So yes, and we have we have opened up some of my wonderful colleagues, uh, Bharat Jayaram and Shambhu Padya, have have opened up a liaison with with several Indian universities and with the connection over there. So anyway, okay. so this is the sort of algebra I do, and the point is that that the Gibbs polynomial of this circuit may be an impediment in quantum complexity, the way the notion of geometric degree gives us the only known nonlinear lower bounds in ordinary complexity. So another article covered that. So the good thing there is, is that for everybody worried about quantum computing's effect on cryptocurrencies, because it could break the cryptography of it, don't worry anymore if Ken is right. Right, well, yeah, so here's the point. By the way, this is Gil Kali, who's a uh, major mathematician, uh, Israeli mathematician, skeptic of quantum computing, a uh, co-author of the paper that statistically refuted the book, The Bible Code. Um, and anyway, uh, so it's a friend of mine. And, but the point is, you know, maybe there's a one in only a one in 10,000 chance I'm right, but $10 billion and more is invested every year in quantum computing. So you multiply one in 10,000 by 10 billion, you're still, you know, talking, well, million, at least a million. <laughs> dollars yeah, like, uh, of 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 potential value to my pursuing that instead of a chess company. So, you know, the, unfortunately the yeah, chess world true. is nearer, so it gets my time, but there's really stuff I should be doing in quantum computing. So that those are the parameters I work on. So so okay, so let me ask you this, and this is about, about chess. Have you moneyballed chess? In other words, are there statistical anomalies that one could take advantage of to better improve a chess. So for instance, you well, you absolutely, my program could be used as a training tool. Most in particular, it could automate or, or better improve what I think a lot of players generally do, which is prepare moves that are risky, but where the chance of the opponent finding the reputation is acceptably low. In other words, gambling moves in the open. That's my student's term. And oh, so so by looking for an, an opening situation where the computer doesn't see anything until ply 15, that could be an effective trap in the opening. Correct. But but even more, so that's a great way to analyze traps, which people could study, but it doesn't necessarily improve chess knowledge. That's true. It's, what about yeah? What about money balling in the sense that and money ball, of course, refer, refers to the statistics of it uh, used in baseball and Michael Lewis's. Uh, famous book, but like, 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 for instance, have you studied what openings tend to be better to study for improving players than other openings or, or what knowledge, right? Uh, that's, if someone wants to make that leap of improvement, is it better to study tactics, end games, openings? Yeah. Like, I, I saw one study you did where people are more likely to make mistakes when they, when they're up upon maybe because they have overconfidence or, or something like that. So are there other anomalies like that? Yes, and you could use my model to, to, to analyze uh, those as well. Um, so in particular, uh, I should call up one other relevant uh, fact in this, in this Neiman case. This is the article written by the famous chess trainer, Jacob Agard, total, titled Paranoia and Insanity. Okay, <laughs> and he says, 
that he can detect obvious big holes in Neiman's game and others. And Neiman himself, for his following game against Ferozja, said that Ferozja has a weakness when he's being directly attacked. Well, you can try to detect or at least you know, label such positions in my program and then compute the opponents, the players' performance on those positions and thereby objectively verify that, yes, this player is not so good when being attacked or not so good with certain point structures or at end games. And I actually think I was a 2600 level player in end games when I co won the US Junior in 1977. All five of my wins were in end games. Wow. So it would be interesting. Over to see, yeah. So it would be interesting to see over uh, an analysis of all games, which ones lead to performance results like that. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you so? I'm, an, I'm an, a, an adult improver after 25 years' absence from tournament play. I am playing in tournaments again. And someone told me at the very beginning of that, your rating is going to instantly fall 200 points, which is what happened mm -hmm. after if a 25 rusty, year I break. Guess. Yeah. It, rusty. And also, do you think age plays a factor? Do you think people who are older calculate weaker and have to use other things like more chess cultural knowledge? Yeah, I'll say that's probably true. Uh, so, so, you know, yeah, like I find myself in research mathematics um, having to, uh, you know, rely on my pattern matching more than deep calculations. Like I've been very tired doing a maximum likelihood calculation to try to add a new feature to my model. And, um, and that is, um, you know, not working out so well. Uh, so, and, and so, so, so with, with chess, like, again, you had something where after you win a pawn, be careful of mistakes. Are there other computer with chess wisdoms that you've developed that you've seen in your data that you've already seen you're not really see i haven't had a chance to play in tournaments and you know maybe since i've monitored so many tournaments it's uh, quite possible that i have been the uh one only player who can't really play in them <laughs> so but i just haven't had time um, have you seen anything come out of the statistics, though, or have you re have you researched anything? So most of your research, obviously, is on the cheating, right. but I bet you you could come up with various. Like it's it strikes me as amazing that no one's really studied which openings will give you the most improvement in rating points on average. Yeah, I mean, there's the, what I was about to say is you know Alpha Zero is famously credited with uh, showing the unsuspected value of the moves H4 or G4 and similar ones to H5 or G5 by black earlier in games. So, so right. there's lots and of people scope have for followed, that. Yeah. Right, like like Carlson, for instance, after Al after Matthew Sadler's you know, studies on Alpha Zero, Carlson started playing H4 and G4 a lot more. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's dead right. So there would be lots of op other opportunities for, for things like that in uh, chess. Well, Ken, Ken Regan, professor at University of Buffalo, Thank you so much for this analysis. I mean, I don't even know what else to ask. I hope you come on again. Yeah. And I've long admired all, all of your work, including mm -hmm. the one game we played that you don't remember, but that's okay. I was, I was unknown and you were the famous international Ken Regan. Mm -hmm. And so, so thanks once again. Is there anything else that you think interesting to say that I'm not asking about the, about the Neiman Carlson situation or, or chess cheating in general yeah well i'd be i'd be very happy to do a separate show where bayesian reasoning uh you know, doomsday argument that sort of philosophical thing and relations to discussions like nasa uh nicholas nasa and Tala, fat tales and because my model intersects with some of that stuff as well and it, i would love to talk about about that so yeah. we'll definitely have to have to schedule that and that's very much relating to trading and investing and and i have a lot of you know he there's a whole difference between a normal curve with fat curves as opposed to a power law situation which he discusses also in his work and we could and this is very relevant for trading particularly as coming up right now for, hypothetically and i've talked about this on the podcast before if china invades taiwan we're going to have a seven sigma event potentially in the stock market and different ways to look at that are are interesting yeah and you're this this is my only be interesting mm -hmm. Well, this is interesting to everybody if they really know what it means, but your P equals MP work is very interesting. Yeah. So we'd love to discuss that at some yeah. point. And, uh, and yeah, all, all that more sciencey stuff. But just to finish uh, on this note, 
is the one un you see the cheating stuff is not unusual information the one unusual information about this case is that Neiman had reviewed the bishop e6 move before the game and i'm not going to say that that was uh, unlikely in itself but the effect to the portion of people's thinking that unusual bit i think has outsized share of the mind space and i think that's the right way to approach this case yeah i think there's an occam's razor here which is that there was enough background suspicion on other things and then Magnus lost in an, what was for him in an unusual fashion that it all kind of bubbled to the top and things got out of hand and, you know, we'll see what happens. So, but then there's a, the more existential question, which is that as let's say someone has a computer chip in their head, you know, if Elon Musk's Neuralink works. Oh yeah. This is a big thing. I talked then about this. Yeah. is chess over. <laughs> right. Uh, how, how do you define yeah, implants? Yeah. How do we define human? Yeah, as a, you know, prosthetics. Oh, that that's a big area. Yes. All right. Well, Ken Regan, we'll we'll discuss that another time. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for having me. At Discount Tire, we know how valuable your time is around the holidays. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com so you can spend more time with friends and family this holiday season. Discount Tire, let's get you taken care of. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.